from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 65, recorded on May 12, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Now, the Monday, Paul, time to take more stuff down. <laughs> this is the video version of Paul's column on Substack, called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we're going to take a look at Paul's recent column, An Open Letter to w Senator William Cassidy, Republican, Louisiana. So let's start, Paul. Why did you write a letter to Senator Cassidy? Well, so today's Monday, May 12th. On Wednesday, May 14th at 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will appear before the Senate Health Committee, Health, Education, Labor, Pension, of which Senator Cassidy, a Republican from Louisiana, heads. This is his chance to hold RFK Jr.'s feet to the fire about a number of things that he has said and done in the last few months since he's been Secretary of Health and Human Services. That's why I wrote the letter. So, so Senator Cassidy voted to uh, approve RFK Jr. in the Senate, correct? Well, that's right. And so w w what's, what's the, w why did he uh, call him to testify? You said hold his feet to the fire. Is, he, is Cassidy, Senator Cassidy aware of the things he's said and the things he's not done that he should be doing? I think he is. The question is whether he'll have the political strength to mm -hmm. stand up and do the right thing for the American public. The, the thing that scares me the most, and this is sort of my main point of this letter, is that, that you see what's about to happen. I mean, RFK Jr. has said that he wants to do a study about, about autism. He wants to study the cause or causes of autism, and he's going to let us know what the results of those studies are really in the next few months. By September, he'll give us an idea. He has said that, that autism is preventable. He has said that autism is caused by an environmental factor, probably a medicine. So you know what's about to happen. He's hired David Geyer, a sort of discredited vaccine autism researcher from the past, um, to be his, his sort of quality control person to help look at the data, which will come presumably from Medicare and Medicaid. So in his second confirmation hearing, RFK Jr. held up a paper by Mawson and colleagues that was Medicaid uh, data from Florida looking at children eight or nine years of age. It was horribly flawed. It wasn't published in a, in a medical journal, wasn't published in a scientific journal, wasn't peer reviewed, so methodologically flawed that you couldn't tell whether children had gotten vaccines from Medicaid or from the Vaccine for Children's program, when they got them, and, and uh, whether or not the outcomes were negative. You couldn't tell. And so that's why it probably never was published. RFK Jr. held up this paper as a gold standard paper for why it is that he now knows that vaccines cause autism. So what he's going to do now is he's going to sort of, I think, fix the books. He's going to shoehorn his his dead-end hypothesis, his flawed dead-end hypothesis that vaccines cause autism into a paper that this time will have the imprimatur of health and human services. And then what I think he's going to do, and this is what scares me the most, if you really want to bring down vaccines in this country, mess around with the vaccine injury compensation program. All you have to do is say, I'm going to add autism to the list of compensable injuries, a disorder that affects one in 32 children in this country, or I'm going to take some of these vaccines out of the vaccine injury compensation program and just leave them open to the slings and arrows of civil litigation and open court. And I think you will make vaccines so expensive that they will become unavailable, unaffordable, and even more feared. That's what scares me because I remember the 1980s. I'm old enough to remember what happened in the 1980s when in April uh, 1982, there was a film that came out called DPT Vaccine Roulette. And it was, it was a powerful, dramatic film. Um, you saw children with withered arms and legs, seizing, drooling, sta staring up at the, at the uh, sky. And the parents all told the same story. My child was fine. Then they got the DTP vaccine, the whole cell pertussis vaccine, and now look at them. And that led to a flood of litigation. We went from eight pertussis vaccine makers to one. And that one pertussis vaccine maker literally said, we're out. We're not making pertussis vaccine. We were about to lose pertussis vaccine for America's children until the Reagan administration stepped in, set up the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which contained the vaccine injury compensation program, which at least stopped the bleeding. But we went from 18 vaccine makers in 1980 to four by the end of the decade. And the same thing could happen here. 
could RFK disable this vaccine compensation program? Yes. And, and Elizabeth Warren said that during the second uh, Senate confirmation hearing. She listed the things he could do the vaccine injury compensation program to make vaccines all the more unaffordable. Right now, every dose of vaccine uh, comes with a 75 cent federal excise tax, hmm. um, which goes into this vaccine injury compensation program, which right now has uh, probably $3 billion in it. So the MMR vaccine, which is a three component vaccine, that's a $2.25 federal excise tax. So there's there's enough money in it to compensate what are real vaccine injuries. I mean, the oral polio vaccine could cause polio. And so that is true. The rotavirus vaccines, both Rotatech or Rotarix, are rare causes of interception. So one can reasonably be compensated. I think when you mandate vaccines for a population, it's reasonable to have a pop-off valve like this. But make autism uh, uh, li on the list, put that on the list of compensable injuries, and you'll exhaust this program. The federal excise tax would only become higher and higher, and companies will be left with the choice of whether they really still wanted to make this product. This, uh, this study that you suggest he might do on autism, presumably this won't be published anywhere because it will be so flawed. Right. Well, he's he's already done things like question the New England Journal of Medicine, considered suing the New England Journal of Medicine because he believes they're all part of that conspiracy. I mean, I just think he can hold it. First of all, you can publish anything anywhere. I mean, there's probably there are about 8,000 papers published a day in the mm -hmm. medical and scientific liter literature, and they follow a bell-shaped curve. Some papers are great, some are awful. Most are more or less mediocre. You can get anything published. I mean, he can publish anything. And then I just think he'll hold it up and say, see, I was right all along. The thing that bugs me, and of the many things that bug me on this, we've been funding autism for 20 years. I mean, the, the, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent every year by the federal government to study autism. We now have the Autism Cares Act, which it gives another $2 billion over the next five years. And we've learned a lot. We've learned about the genetics of autism, and there's just not one gene like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease, it's many genes, but they're developmental genes expressed early in in, uh, in pregnancy. Um, there, there are certainly drugs one can take during pregnancy that increases your risk of autism, like valproic acid. There are maternal factors like uh, psychiatric disorders or obesity or diabetes, which can influence the, inc the incidence of autism. Maternal and paternal age both can do that. Interuterine infections can increase your risk of autism. All of those, though, occur before you're born. So I think the odds are, looking at all the data cumulatively, that that you're probably born with autism, but he just throws that away. He says autism is preventable, and I'm going to show you how. So I will quote Albert Sabin, who said this to me once, uh, here with respect to these studies that you just described, RFK Jr. either hasn't read them or doesn't believe them. <laughs> now, um, I find it, Interesting that Reagan recognized the value of protecting children's health. Let's remind everyone, he was a Republican. So today's Republican Party is very different uh, than it was in the 80s because they seem to be more interested in politics than children's health. No, you're right. I mean, certainly Reagan's administration was not known for its social programs, but here you have a, a very important social program that protected vaccines and therefore protected children in this country. And I just feel like, where are the Republicans now? I, how much more information do you need that this this man, RFK Jr., is doing everything he can to make vaccines less available, less affordable, and more feared? I mean, how you know, it just there's an old expression, which is, um, if everybody shows a little courage, no one has to be a hero. Stand up for the children of this country, please. You say in the article that it's possible that he would make vaccines unaffordable or unavailable. So what would happen, Paul? I think these companies would stop making them. It is a fragile infrastructure, vaccines. I mean, there are four companies, for the most part, that make vaccines for America's children. It's less than 10% of what they can do. Make it onerous enough, and they'll, they'll leave the market. Vaccines are given once or a few times in your lifetime. They're never going to compete with things like lipid-lowering agents or psychiatric drugs or neurological drugs. Make it onerous enough, and they'll leave, because they did. We had 27 companies that made vaccines in, in the mid-1950s. By 1980, it had, had gone down to 18, mostly through sort of merger and dropout. 
And then when it was, it was made um, much more difficult for these companies to make it, you saw companies leave. So we had essentially four companies. It's the same thing now with the kind of placebo controlled trials. You know, let's, let's consider uh, the fact that according to RFK Jr. that we never did a placebo controlled trial, which is complete nonsense. Um, but he just keeps throwing these things out, these sort of hurdles that companies are going to have to jump through and make it expensive enough and they won't do it anymore. So let's look at a scenario where vaccines are not available, maybe childhood vaccines will have an increase, a huge increase in the amount of infectious diseases in the next few years. Will then people realize that his approach is flawed or will he just say there's, he'll blame it on something else? So that's the question. I mean, how much pain are we willing to take? We've had three people die of measles this year. That's the total number that died of measles in the last 25 years. We've had two childhood deaths. Those, that's the, the first child that died was the first time we've had a child die of measles in this country in more than 20 years. Um, we've had a massive outbreak now of measles. You have more pertussis. You have a handful of states that have experienced pertussis deaths that they haven't experienced pertussis deaths in years. You have 216 people who have babies. Children, children less than 18 who died of influenza. That's the most we've seen since 2009, the swine flu pandemic. How much are we willing to take? I, I was uh, seeing a, a, a pediatrician at a playground recently because I have my grandchildren here. And, um, you know, she said to me, it's never been worse. People are just, mm -hmm. they, they don't want vaccines and they feel emboldened not to get them. She said, that's what's different. In the past, people have always been questionable about questioning vaccines. Now they just are absolutely confident that they're right because you have basically a, a power structure now that says they're right. I mean, the anti-vaccine activists have been shouting from the sideline for decades. Now they're making policy. I guess that answers the question. All the, all the measles cases, the deaths, the pertussis, the pediatric influenza deaths, it's still not enough to convince people that they need to be vaccinating their kids. How interesting is that? I mean, how, many, how many children need to die in, in uh, school shootings before we have gun control? Uh, you would have thought Sandy Hook would have yeah. been the end of that. Yeah, I mean, that's just unacceptable. So many children have died there. So we should expect that many, many more have to die from infectious diseases. So you, you write in your letter to Senator Cassidy also uh, what – RFK Jr. should have been doing during the measles outbreak? Can you tell us that? What he should have been doing is he should have stood up loudly and clearly and held a press conference every other day saying, this is unacceptable. We need to vaccinate our children. We, we, here's what, these are deaths that are utterly preventable. These are hospitalizations that are completely preventable. We need to vaccinate our children. He's done exactly the opposite. He goes on national television and says, measles vaccine kills people every year. Measles vaccine causes blindness and deafness. Measles vaccine causes the same symptoms as measles. And worse, he goes on to say, the measles virus, natural measles infection can protect against cancer, can protect against autoimmune disease. The natural measles gives you lifelong protection, whereas the vaccine induced immunity fades. All of that is wrong. So he's done the exact opposite of that. It's, it's almost unimaginable, actually, how bad he's been and how the Republicans continue to stand back and, and let this happen. It's, it's enough. It's enough. So surely, as a doctor, as a medical doctor, Senator Cassidy should be recognizing this, right? Yes, I think I think Senator Cassidy does recognize this. And I, I'd like to believe that there are Republicans out there that also do recognize this. There's just sort of a lack of political courage these days. And I mean, Republicans aren't bad people. They... They're, they, I think they, they have, they too have children. I think they'd like to protect their. I am the the child of two Republicans, so I know that Republicans <laughs> can have children. <laughs> so you also write um, in the in your letter that he RFK Jr. has done nothing about the pertussis outbreak. He hasn't, hasn't said a word, right? Right. And, and the protest outbreak this year is about four times uh, greater than last year. And last year was about six times greater than the year before. Uh, this is um, a disease that basically kills young babies uh, because it's sort of the mucus blocks the windpipe and a, a young child has a narrow windpipe. And um, it's it's uh, it can be a fatal disease. And, and before there was a pertussis vaccine, there were about 8000 deaths a year, mostly in children. And I think um, that. Uh, you know, is that where we want to go again? We go back to the 1920s when we had pertussis killed children every year. So you would say that RFK Jr. should be out there every few days 
telling, encouraging people to be vaccinating their kids against pertussis, but it's been silent, right? It goes against everything he believes. As he said, he said no vaccines benefit of benefit. He said that when he sees a parent on a hiking path carrying a child, he goes up to that parent and says, don't vaccinate your child. And he believes he saved that child. He said if he could go back in time, he would pay anything not to vaccinate his own children. He's an anti-vaccine activist. He's exactly who he's been for the last 20 years. You would think he would have changed to some extent, right? Because then he was paid, say, by the Children's Health Defense. He was a paid lawyer to represent a group that was anti-vaccine. He's not paid by them anymore. He's paid by me and you. He's paid by the, 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 the populace, the American public, to represent the public's health. But he still sees himself for what he's always been, which is an anti-vaccine activist. You're right. No amount of data showing he is wrong will change his mind. He he approaches it with a religious fervor. Right. He still says the MMR vaccine causes autism. I'm sure that'll be a target in what he's, is going to be upcoming, quote unquote, data, um, even though there's been 24 studies. Done what, would he, what would he say, Paul, if you said... If we reminded him that before polio vaccines, we had up to 50,000 cases of paralyzed people every year here in the U.S. What would he say to that? He says the polio vaccine killed many, many, many more people than he <laughs> ever said because he believes that that SV40 issue, the simian virus 40 issue, which contaminated early lots of, of the Sabin and Salk vaccine, um, that that caused cancer, even though study after study after study done five years later, eight years later, 15 years later, 30 years later, showed that wasn't true. It doesn't matter. He just holds these beliefs like a religious conviction. So what are you asking Cassidy to do in the end? Do the right thing. Ask him to step down from this position. I mean, let's assume that there are uh, aspects of the Make America Health healthy, uh, make America healthy again, uh, that are good. I mean, we can eat better. We don't have to eat ultra processed foods. We don't necessarily need artificial dyes or flavorings. I'm all for that. I think we, the, we spend a lot on healthcare and don't get great bang for our buck. I'm all for that. There are a lot of people who can head that, that, that aren't anti-vaccine zealots. Pick one of them. Do you think he will ask RFK Jr. to step down? No. First of all, he would have to be impeached. I think that's the way it would work. I mean, Congress would have to, which which could happen just by a majority vote, impeach him, and then it would go to the Senate and they would have to convict him. I, I don't see that happening. I, I, it would have to get much worse for that to happen. Yeah. With this, with Republican control of Congress, yeah, I agree. It's not going to happen. And I don't think he has a conscience at all. So he's not going to step down voluntarily. But it will be interesting to see how the hearing goes, Paul. Yep, Wednesday, one we We'll put a link to this column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.